Hello, 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 Tyler Bryden here. I hope everything is going well. Sometimes I try not to date videos, but in this case, I'm doing predictions for 2023. We're coming up to the very, very end of 2022. And I find that that's a, a fantastic time to sort of use all the knowledge, everything that you've learned throughout this year um, to try to um, articulate where are we headed. And then with that prediction, with that uh, sort of uh, guesstimate uh, that is being made or those guesstimates being made, you can start to align goals, how you're going to adapt, what you're trying to achieve to those predictions. And uh, so uh, in this video, in this little article I've put together, um, I am doing uh, predictions for 2023. And I actually uh, shared this with uh, my wonderful partner, Monica, before this. And one of the things instantly said is like, I already know these predictions. And so one thing I'll say is some of these might seem obvious to you if you're sort of following the same data sources and media and things that I'm uh, following. So that's one thing. Uh, second disclaimer is I'm an idiot. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I very uh, likely that I am wrong uh, in these cases. I'm not even holding on to these predictions overly tightly. And I think if any of us have, um, you know, uh, sort of built this concrete um, paradigm of what the world is in our mind over these last few years, I think we would be pretty... Um, you know, that, that's a hard thing to do with just the the randomness, the uh, things that have come out of nowhere in the world. And uh, and so uh, while you make these predictions, I don't think you can make them too far in advance. Um, the more far in advance, the less likely you're going to be to get correct, or at least on the timeline that you're thinking about. Um, and so I'm looking in just a year. A couple other things that I think uh, are, on average, 65% of adults worldwide say they're optimistic that 23 uh, will be a better year for them than in 2022. So I think optimism is a good thing to have now. Uh, does our optimism align with reality? Uh, that is yet to be uh, determined, um, but it is something uh, that I hope does. Uh, 2022 year it was a pretty wild and rough year for many of us. And uh, as I go through a couple of the predictions, um, I think you can see one that's coming up, um, then I will maybe touch uh, on that. I'd like to make riskier predictions. I, I don't really know what those are, but I do have a couple of resources um, at the bottom here. I'll actually skim through quickly and just pull them up so that I can share them uh, in the video after. And Some of them are super interesting. One of them I'll just highlight quickly here. One of my favorite websites for many, many years. I came across this a long, long time ago is futuretimeline.net. They've done an entire redesign of this and it looks like they've pulled back some of the predictions, but basically throughout uh, years, you can see predictions that are being made. They use a bunch of data and, you know, smart people and, you know, lots of theory and stuff to sort of make these predictions. So when uh, I spent a little bit of time before this video, looking at some of these resources um, and, uh, you know, just trying to understand, hey, I've got my own predictions. Are they aligned with other people's predictions? Do they make sense? Am I, again, reminding myself um, that I'm an idiot? Uh, this Ipsos one is really interesting, talking about sort of um, people, uh, sort of like how they're thinking about the economy in 2023, the world security environment. Uh, I could, you know, touch on those briefly, but I think these articles will be resources in the YouTube uh, description on the website here as well, too. And you can click into those if you're uh, interested in exploring those. So I'll hop into mine and I'm giving you a little sneak peek as I scroll through this. First one, starting off on a pessimistic note, a lot more companies will fail. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for this. I think one of them is that there was cheap cash and you know, uh, just sourced into the economy. And in this case, I'm biased. There's a, um, there's a, a tendency to look at technology companies as a whole, which have been you know, brutally destroyed in the public stock market this year. And then with that have also been, uh, you know, pretty destroyed in the private market. And that's especially sat at the later series where series D, series E, you know, companies that are maybe looking to go towards public, but then don't see uh, going public as a viable uh, avenue with the current market conditions. And because those valuations are so propped up and so high from frothy markets, maybe that they really raised in the year before, they are unable to raise funding at that valuation. And so they're left, you know, se severely cutting costs, which we've seen in layoffs and lots of different things. Um, they are forced to have a down round, which no investor wants, uh, no company really wants. 
it dilutes the equity. It creates uh, write downs for the investors who are investing in those companies. And really, it just uh, it's it's hard to move forward after that. It, it impacts employees and all this stuff. Now, generally, I think there is um, a little bit more of uh, an acceptance of this based on the market conditions. But I think that's still something that is, you know, hard to uh, do and something that a lot of people don't want to do. And I'll say that I've seen this with not just late stage companies, I've seen it with early stage companies. And I'll give an example of a company I know who did a series A at about an $80 million valuation, which was a huge revenue multiple, let's say 70 times revenue multiple. And now they're in a place where uh, it's gonna be very hard for them to even do a series B at that rate, uh, at that valuation, because the multiples on the uh, annual revenue have shrunk from that 80 times, 70 times down to, uh, you know, a much more normative eight times, 10 times. And there is some leniency in the early stage where you can, um, you know, still uh, get the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, maybe good investors don't want to dilute founders and early team too early, because then it, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't incentivize them to continue to be a part of the business, but it's still um, a cert, you know, a, a, a huge challenge. I think just overall, there are those are the challenges for good companies, and there are ch- companies who are not good companies, not good, who are not mission critical, who will or maybe aren't as well connected, who haven't raised funding or haven't been uh, previously exited on a company before, these companies are going to struggle even more deeply uh, to uh, raise the funding required. And I think right now we're seeing probably the last, or in 2023, we're going to see the six to nine months runway of a lot of these companies dry up continued layoffs, continued businesses shut down. And, um, you know, I think that is going to be a, a pretty wild year overall in what we see in the terms of companies failing. And I've got a point I'm going to attach to this later that sort of sparked for me just talking through that, that I think is really uh, important. So I'll jump first, uh, which is another one that, uh, again, Monica said, Tyler, come on, give us more than this. There, The question is, or the prediction there is that there will be a recession. Most people are predicting this. They don't know how um, deep or long or big of a recession uh, this is going to be. But this idea of like inflation being transitory, um, that the instrument of increasing interest rates having a, you know, a significant impact on those uh, inflation on that inflation rate um, doesn't seem to crystallize the way that they want. And of course, there is still um, time for that to to happen, but uh, it's not happening as quickly as possible. And you know, most all of them will and it connects to the next point, which is the uh, Fed, the Bank of Canada say if inflation stays high, continues to run rampant, then they will continue to raise interest rates. And so uh, like Monica, I, we bought a house 2021, high, high valuation on that house, beautiful, low 0.99 uh, interest rate. And, you know, against our own gut, we went, okay, we'll do this variable because we had this mo- thought in mind where, you know, historically interest rates hadn't risen that highly. There was this thought that sort of passed along to us that, hey, they only raise, you know, maybe four times a year and generally it's like 0.25. So that gives us a long way and in the end, it's gonna pan out better for us than if we go for a fixed rate at the time. Um, that did not, uh, that hurt, that was a painful thing. And and many of us felt that um, pain this year in 2022. And unfortunately, my prediction based off what I'm seeing is that they're gonna continue to rise because inflation is gonna continue to sort of you know, some people talking about sort of this peak um, that we've hit it, other people talking sort of this bouncing along the sort of bottom and it's going to double dip and then I've been saying a bunch of stupid shit right now. It's going to go back up and then it's not, so it's not uh, deflating the way that we want. And so at the very, you know, maybe we stay flat uh, and in a very, very lucky scenario, we drop just slightly. And I think there were a lot of people who thought, hey, 2023 interest rates will start to decline. My prediction is that maybe at the tail end of 2023, based on how the year goes, that happens. But it's going to be a lot less than we hoped um, for any of us who are sitting in uh, this kind of situation. So I'm personally not holding on uh, to optimism in this regard. Um, A prediction that if you have been following my channel probably makes sense is this idea of generative AI continuing to explode. Uh, I talked, you know, about many of the companies in this space. Uh, We've got OpenAI here, Stability. We've got Jasper, Cohere. 
these companies, there's more in this, more, much more beyond that uh, happening mid journey. Um, uh, a 21 lab, a 21 labs. Oh, I should have said that. I shouldn't have said that. I'm an idiot. Uh, and, uh, and, but the accumulation of technology, the accumulation of excitement of mainstream um, adoption of this, we saw the Lensa AI sort of uh, people using uh, stability AI sort of to upload images themselves and then modify that. All of that is accumulating into massive, um, I would say, sort of uh, just moment in time where uh, this will continue to grow and I think continue to explode. I'm seeing that in the Google trends right now. I'm seeing that when I create videos, some of the videos that, that I've created, thousands and thousands of views, 10,000 views on a crappy little video I made about the release about ChatGPT. The thirst for this is absolutely enormous. And I think it speaks to this core human desire. I write about it in here is this, it's creativity that many of us would want, but don't want to work hard enough to achieve that laziness that comes with that, uh, the instant gratification. And none of that in human behavior is going away anytime soon. In fact, this, uh, takes us, you know, deeper down that journey, uh, and quicker down that journey of, um, those, those things that are part of our human core behavior. And so business cases will, um, emerge. There'll be more fine tuning of models and, uh, companies that then emerge to um, supplement these businesses. That's where I would say, you know, Jasper has come in. And I think they're going to have to fight to continue to differentiate as more and more companies adopt this um, as, you know, ChatGP, uh, ChatGPT goes live and people then experiment and say, hey, I want to embed this in my own platform. And why would I use Jasper with this big markup when I could just use this and, and then do? Uh, so there's a lot of, I think, uh, things that will come out. Uh, of this and GPT-4 um, is scheduled to be released in the next couple of months and it will be a big deal. It's going to be interesting if they don't necessarily deliver on the technology jump that people hoped. Will people be underwhelmed? I actually don't think so. I think even incremental shifts at this point are uh, pretty phenomenal, especially if you're doing an actual interaction layer and trying to find business cases out of it. And Money will continue to pour there. Interest will continue to pour there. There may be that bubble that happens in the, you know, the crypto, the NFT, all of these things. Um, but uh, at some point, some of these companies will uh, continue to uh, drive huge technological change and fundamental, um, you know, just uh, edits to how we operate as humans. Uh, OpenAI apparently with a $75 billion valuation, predicting billion dollars in revenue in 2024. Uh, these are all um, coming at once. And I just think the point I wanted to add on to that is that I think people will increasingly get worried about their job security. And uh, as these technologies have emerged, things like writing code or editing code, creating video, creating text, um, a lot of things that we thought were fundamentally that were human endeavors have been already surpassed or at least equal, uh, you know, or equal performance. But when you say equal, maybe sort of equal quality, but the performance is so much higher because it can do it at so, so much scale with so much un understanding of language, comp computational power, that I think it's a really scary time for people as a whole. And so, um, you know, if you can, uh, you know, my, based on this prediction, I'm, you know, embedding this into our own software at Speak AI. Um, I'm understanding how to use it, understanding how it works and trying to find, you know, where do we all sit uh, and where can we all create value in, uh, you know, a, a world that's going to be continually, you know, infiltrated by this kind of technology at rapid speeds that I don't think many of us uh, truly comprehend um, at this state. And, you know, with that, I'll just tap on one sort of sub point related to generative AI, which is text to video and text to audio, which will emerge in full. And I have, I have somewhere um, the audio version of it, I believe is it harmonica uh, AI, I'm, I'm sorry if I got this uh, wrong. Um, they're all sort of, it seems like they're all connected to stability AI in some point. I've got this wrong, but there's um, a couple of companies that have released recently. Um, I'll, I'll relink these in the YouTube description and on the site uh, if you come back and revisit um, um, text to audio. So generating sounds, generating music, which is a huge, you know, disruptor in what's happening right now. And typically what is a 
pretty daunting uh, manual sort of labor task. Um, we've also obviously seen text to video, Funaki from Google, Imogen video, Facebook text to video, Stability AI, Runway ML. Um, all these are linked. You can check um, all of these out doing like just, you know, mind blowing things. Runway is definitely one to keep an eye on uh, in this Funaki, which is like long form storytelling video creation that then can be upscaled to a high resolution, like absolutely insane. In these cases, like, uh, you know, in 2022, these are sort of just like research use cases that emerge, but with the interest with, con I think, the continued race to dominate this space, these are going to just emerge in so much more drastically in 2023 and change the way that we're creating and interacting with media. And uh, I think we're maybe not, again, fully prepared for how fundamentally this is going to shift our experience of the world and interaction with media, people, and things. Uh, it's super, super uh, interesting. And uh, I'll definitely be paying attention to this trend and you know, creating more videos and stuff on it in 2023. Um, one thing about the vaguest, uh, uh, most, uh, you know, ridiculous, um, uh, prediction that I could make is probably like the, the one is just, there will be a massive technological breakthrough. And, um, I don't know what I sort of said, I don't know, not sure from who I'm not sure what field it's going to be in. I have this sort of inkling that it's going to be in climate, uh, cause there's been so much money and, and energy that's been put into the space. Um, there was this sort of signal with some nuclear fusion, um, uh, milestones that were hit that, uh, were, you know, if you want to see, uh, some that, you know, it's super interesting to talk about it on the all end and a little bit of debate about the validity of that and what this means. But overall, I just, I can just feel this sort of intersection of all these things coming together and I can't quite wrap my head around what it is but I just feel like it's going to be uh, massive and uh I I I don't know again what it's going to be but I feel like when it happens we will know uh and I'm not counting the sort of generative AI uh and large language models and natural language processing I'm deeply embedded in that space I don't think I'm counting it in this I'm actually looking for something outside of that I just know that those sort of spaces are innovating at such high speeds I'm thinking it's going to be uh, something else. Uh, maybe it's space, climate, um, some sort of uh, sort of building uh, or nanobot. I don't know what it is. All right, so I, the prediction is quite loose on that regard. But uh, I appreciate you, you know, at least being there with me. I think most of us have some sort of prediction of that. I just think the 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 the, the monumental size that I'm thinking at is my sort of prediction of just how big uh, it actually is. And then the the last one that I have here. There's probably more I could make, but I'm going to wrap, uh, you know, this up on this is like the conflict between remote and in-person work. And, you know, I've got some, it looks like these uh, companies are unlinked. I should be linking them, but some really interesting sort of predictions when pandemic came about removing to remote work in the world that that, um, you know, creates and that that's in, 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 in general, a very convenient way to work. Uh, and then as the world has sort of come back together with, I think, uh, COVID in the rear view. Obviously there's some things happening right now. Uh, this, the questions around the success of this and is fully remote work conducive to success and culture, I think specifically, um, are, are going to emerge even more strongly, especially as companies valuations get hit as apparently productivity peaks in many places. Um, there's a really interesting interest with Mark Benioff of Salesforce. He openly published in a Slack channel questioning if remote work was the reason why productivity had dropped and why the new hires during that time don't seem to have the same output as ones previously. I think generally these, uh, big visionary companies, uh, do have, um, you know, some success from putting people in sort of these conscious collisions uh, within the buildings. And that's why these huge offices spaces have been built to support this. And now they've got all these big, you know, offices that they spend billions of dollars on uh, and people, no one's there. I think beyond just the sort of culture and, uh, you know, uh, contribution to success, there's some sort of ego version of there. And it's like, also like, Hey, we've built this for you and you're not coming. Like, I think that's a hard thing, um, to, uh, deal with. And, and then just again, companies sort of needing to focus on revenue generation and profit in a way that was lost in several years as this sort of cheap cash 
uh, was floating around in the economy. And so I think that conflict is going to uh, rear its head even more so, especially as more layoffs happen, as I think employees or employers, sorry, get a little bit more power back in the negotiation on how people work and how they hire and the wages um, that they pay. We might see wages shift. Um, I think there's a lot of things within this sort of subcategory um, that will come around in 2023 around hiring trends, remote and in-person work, the dynamics of power in hiring versus um, being the employee. Uh, and I see that um, definitely continuing to crescendo um, in 2023. So that was my, uh, I, I guess, my predictions for 2023. I hope you got some insight uh, out of them. As always, I got, you can see them up on the top there. I got a ton of links. Uh, I hope that you uh, click them if you would like. Uh, and then now I've got this dedicated page. I might make some updates on here, just sort of elaborate as I've talked through a couple of things. But um, this video um, was meant to supplement um, these predictions for 2023. And then I am, and again, trying to orientate my worldview, how I'm going to operate in 2023 around uh, um, these sort of predictions. Uh, and again, I think in, in most cases that these are somewhat maybe obvious predictions, or at least I'm trying to make one, you, you know, trying to make predictions that are most likely going to be true. Um, because if I'm making predictions that could be entirely wrong, um, then, um, you know, maybe that puts me in a, you know, a win situation because I've gone against the grain, but it could also, um, be counterintuitive and counterproductive. So, uh, again, I, I would love to hear your predictions if you got some, um, I, uh, I, 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 I'm finishing off 2022 as strong as I absolutely can. I appreciate you being part of this journey. Um, I look forward to connecting in 2023 and hopefully, uh, you know, honoring that Ipsos poll and having it a better year than 2022 for you for me, for everyone. Uh, thank you as always. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful start to 2023. Bye-bye.